Welcome to the Liverpool FA podcast. Our aim is to provide regular insight from a variety of experts to help you in your own football journey. We'll do it through interviews, roundtable discussions and by linking to other resources to help support you. For more information about each episode, just tap the album art, which will provide you with more about our guests and links to further content. Welcome back. I hope you're well and you're having a good season so far. Our guest today is Andy Foster, who for many needs very little introduction. Andy is currently Head of Coaching at Middlesbrough Academy and is a former National Coach Developer at the FA. Andy's got a wealth of experience from the game and was kind enough to give up a couple of hours of his time to discuss his role, the academy and some of its experiences. During his time at the Football Association, Andy was instrumental in delivering the key messages of the Youth Award around the country. And you won't find a nicer, more honest and integral guy in the game. He's somebody that I've certainly learnt a lot from in my time. Local events going on in Liverpool on Tuesday the 26th of March. We have an Introduction to Futsal free CPD event. And that's at Liverpool County FA, 6.30pm until 930 So there's still places available if you want to register on liverpoolfa.com. So I hope you enjoy this one with Andy Foster. Andy Foster, welcome aboard. Good afternoon. It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. (laughs) Which is a a lesson that you taught me a long time ago. So um, thanks for the permission to, uh, to come and have a chat to you and get you on the show. No problem. And I uh, hope you'll forgive me for the next couple of hours <laughs> that we're going to put you through. Yeah, we're fine. Um, so for those that don't know you, um, can you give us a bit of an explanation about who you are, what what you do, and yeah. maybe why I've I've managed to collar you down to get you on here? Can indeed. So my background, taking it back to the start, really, a schoolboy footballer in and around the Hull area, um, Reasonably talented, so managed to sign a schoolboy form at 14 years old for Grimsby Town, who at that time were in the the old second division, which would be now the championship. 16 went there as, a, as an apprentice footballer, but released at 18 because uh, I wasn't good enough, essentially. Um, came back to Hull and decided to join Humberside Police, where I served for 16 years. And then at the age of you know, my mid-30s, I got the opportunity to work in football full-time, which... Um, was then a difficult decision in terms of I was halfway to my pension in the police and do I stay or do I go but I didn't want to look back with regrets in 20 years time and think I should have took the opportunity to work in football so I left to go and work at East Riding County FA as the county development manager and whilst there I went on a one year secondment to the football association as a development manager for the region and then during that period I applied for and was successful in getting a role as a regional coach development manager originally for the 5 to 11 programme when the skills programme was introduced and then was in that role for a number of years before I moved into the national coach developer team which was primarily working at the top end of the game in terms of qualifications regarding the air licence and supporting the coaches out in situ in the clubs and different environments that they were working in and then again another leap of faith earlier well back end of last year in April where an opportunity came for me to leave the Football Association and go and work as the head of coaching at Middlesbrough Football Club um, for me personally I'd always had an itch to go and work in professional football before I retired even though I'm not too old at the moment but before the end of my career I wanted to test if I knew what I knew or if I could do what I thought I could do so a great opportunity to go and work in a club with a great reputation and started at Middlesbrough Football Club on the 1st of May this year oh sorry 1st of May last year 2017 yeah. so I've now been there nine months as head, head of, coaching. of coaching for the academy yeah great stuff um, so so real whistle stop tour there yeah um, I want to and obviously there's no route into coaching that is typical but I think yours is fairly atypical yeah um, let's let's go back to your time at Humberside Police yeah you know what were you doing at, at that point Tell, yeah. talk us through you know, you know those 16 years of experiences yeah. you must have yeah I mean Alongside the police, it, obviously I hadn't stopped being involved in football, so outside of the police work, I was still involved with coaching at Hull City Centre of Excellence, doing some work for the, the football association on fun weeks, um, and, and then just gathering a range of experiences in the football world. But specifically within the police, I did a range of jobs from being a, the old Bobby on the beat, working three shifts, days, nights, and late turns, um, worked in the divisional criminal justice system and then also worked 
within local intelligence later on, um, working in the city centre in Hull. So all all the time I was still doing the football and what, what the police gave me, so sort of maybe looking back now, is it just gave me a great opportunity to interact with a wide variety of people from obviously senior managers within the organisation and other organisations down to people who were struggling in life generally. So it was a really wide remit and exposure to people. Yeah, and I, I can vouch for that in a, in a similar uh, vein with our role or with our work in, in coach development. I'm sure you probably had a similar yeah. thing where you run a, a course for grassroots coaches and you've got mums and dads and, um, and people from totally... You know, a, yeah. a real wide range of walks of life and experiences and yeah. it's recognising what they, those people bring that's it that's, that's to, for me is the the people connection the, the people connection in the police is definitely something that's helped with understanding coaching because coaching is about understanding people again um, and for us as coach developers it was about that again that diverse range of people that would be in front of you at any given time but then understanding they're going to go out and work with a diverse range of players, whether it be young people or adults, in in their football context. So it's it's for me, it's all about people. Yeah. So what what were some of the um, most impactful lessons then that you you learned from your time in the, in the police and and how do they apply in your in your coaching role either now or from from previous? Yeah, you've got you've got um, the, the ability to question. I think that goes from people who may have seen incidents so you're talking of maybe witnesses in the past where they're giving you their version of what they think they've seen Um, so you've got to elicit more information by good questioning but alongside that you've got to have good listening skills as well which is essential because if you miss things that they're they're telling you then you may have missed the most important bit Um, so listening is important Um, and then again reading people's body language because sometimes people didn't want to engage with the police um, and it was a case of trying to find a way, and then often it would be reading their their look, their facial expressions, their body language, whether they're resistant to you, whether they're open with what they're saying. So it was all about reading verbal and non-verbal cues with people, really. And as I said, the listening skills that definitely transfers to working with players now because I see things in my current role in the academy where the boys are bright players. And often they'll question the coaches or they'll comment on something that's going on in the session. And I'm encouraging the coaches to listen for those moments because they're sometimes the gems where the lads are asking a question or they're probing something they're doing. And if we miss that opportunity to to pick it up and then explore it with them, we might just miss an opportunity to help them get better. Take me back to just just last night, even I was um, working with a group of uh, grassroots coaches, all of whom are dads of under sevens under eights yeah. who uh, have got, we're running a bespoke course for the club at the moment and we got the kids in for the the coaches to to run a session with last night and we just did some um really fairly basic analysis on the on the coach interactions yeah. and behaviors and they, i've asked them if if we can discuss this today and they're, they're fine with that but in a in about a 15 minute window we were recorded about the best part of a hundred interactions with yeah. that three coaches had with a group of players, and and none of them were questions. Yeah. And yeah. when we fed that back to them, it, they might have had an image of how they behaved, and yeah. it was quite an eye opener that the majority of those interactions were instructions yeah. and directions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how how important do you do you see that questioning process for coaches working with players at the moment? I think it's essential. I- I, well, going back to my early days working for the FA I was lucky enough to be exposed to a lad called Paul Holder who a lot of people listening will know from his time at the FA was involved with devising the FA Youth Awards and particularly the Module 2 mm-hmm. and he's now head of coaching at Brighton and I always remember it, on a course with him early on he drew a big face on the board and it, you, you're laughing because you've probably seen him do something similar and what he said to the coaches in front of him was you've got two eyes, two ears and one mouth so he said, try to use the eyes and the ears more than you do the mouth because they, they outnumber each other as, as on the face. And it was, it was quite a funny moment and it, it, that sort of resonated with me um, because if we, if we don't listen and watch carefully, we miss opportunities. Um, impact information, you can, t- you can, again, going back to what I know now, you can tell, but it doesn't stay f- as long as maybe a question where you prompt the, the player or you sow seed with them. And you, and you don't necessarily need the answer there and then. 
Um, we, we've done a thing recently with the part-time staff at our place where we put a thing on the chart where if the boy comes into the academy at under nines and stays with us through to under 16s, for 40 weeks of the season, we see him twice in training and once in a game, which then increases, obviously, as they go up to under 16s. And what we came up with was that the coaches will have 1,400 contact points with the boys between under nines and under 16s. So they don't need to be told there then and fix it that night. You're going to have other opportunities, but if you can lay the foundations by good questioning, you might get the answers further down the road. Wow, that's uh, that's some number when you when you break it down and think about it like that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you said the foundations of good questioning, what what would that be? I think for me, the the thing that underpins good questioning is knowing your subject matter. So if you so for co- for football coaches, it's understanding and knowing the game. Now we'll all have a variety of depths of knowledge and experience around that. So if if you know the game, you can probably shape your practice. And if you shape your practices, you probably know what your outcomes are going to be. And therefore, you, your questions are effectively shaped by knowing what you'd like the players to be better at in the long term or better at understanding at the end of that night's session. But it all fits into that 1,400 contact points for me. Yeah. So it's, it's got to be... The game underpins everything we know. Um, and if you know the game, you can start to design practices and questions that will help the players understand it better. And I think, yeah, you, you mentioned there about about designing practices and questions and I think that's something that um, certainly I'm trying to get into a better habit of, in myself and yeah. the coaches that I work with is, is is in your session plan okay you've got the X's and O's and you know what you're going to do yeah. but actually how how much do we plan yeah. our interactions and um, like you say those, those questions um, and because often the, question, the type of question that I'll see and I'm guilty of this no end is I've got an answer in my head and I'm going to ask the players and yeah. I expect you to give me the answer. Yeah. And by the way, I'll probably ask it to the group and the um, the most dominant or socially confident player within that group will then feed me the answer exactly that, that he or she thinks that I'm looking for yeah. back. And yeah. we don't really get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm consciously trying to really be considerate and, th- and think about the questions that I'm asking and yeah. why, for what reason. And just rather than asking and waiting for an answer, asking yeah. and just planting a seed and letting yeah. it germinate yeah again it's it's lucky the people and again I think sometimes for me more experience of coaching helps me with this whereby you do ask that question and, and the players maybe can't articulate it to you there and then but just send them back into the practice and, and sometimes as coaches we want the players to verbally articulate to us what they can do or what they know because it's reassuring for us as coaches that we're doing our job right well, sometimes players can't articulate what they know or what they're doing. And your feedback as the coach is putting them back in the practice and watching them do it well again. So accept that as your feedback. Even if the player who's doing something well can't articulate to you why, watching them do it well consistently is your feedback that you need. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's another thing that sometimes is the is the feedback or is the answer for us or is it for the benefit of the players? Or for learning. Or for learning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and we we were speaking before we hit record about um, other stuff that that you'd uh, taken from your time in the police, and you mentioned about the skill of interviewing. Yeah. Um, how does that translate into the work that you do now? Yeah, going back to the, the sort of the question a couple of minutes ago about um, sort of outcomes and endpoints. So, if I was interviewing, I don't know, maybe suspects, for instance, you probably have an idea of what they've been up to, and it's quite funny talking about police in a football coaching context. But obviously the best evidence was to get them to, to tell your answer in a way that was leading you to the outcome you, th- you thought you were going to get. Same with the young players in football, whether it's a session or a game, you probably, you've probably you got some outcomes that you would like to achieve within that session. Um, but you don't necessarily have to go fast forward to the answer by you telling and showing all the time. I, I once had a conversation with a colleague of ours, Roger Davis, when I was going off to an in-service event, and I think it was in, in Workington one night, and he said to me, I always remember, he said to me, what are you doing? And I, it was something around, I don't know, say if it was a dribbling topic, for instance. And he said, oh, what, what have you got planned? I said, well, I've got this planned, but the best bit is I know where I want to get to, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I think that was my mindset then was, I think I know where I want to get to, but I don't know what it's going to look like, and the deciding factor is how the kids performed. So often you see coaches who 
we'll have a, a fantastic session plan. It'll have three or four, four progressions within it. And the coach is determined to make sure that all those progressions are in the session. Um, and sometimes it's not what the kids need. And that's why, like I say, I keep going back to this 1400 where we reminded our coaches of it. If you get to the only the second progression within a session, then that's all right. Because you can do three, four and five sometime further on if you're planning effectively for the long-term development of the players. So you don't have to fix everything tonight. Um, I think I've gone off a tangent there. No, no, not at all, no. But it, it, winding back, there was something you, you said about uh, about the interviewing. Uh, and you said you think you know what they've done. I imagine that it's it, back then it was important and also difficult to kind of remove that unconscious bias. Yeah. If that yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what, what did you learn about about yourself and your own biases again that and, and how might that translate into into the work that you're doing at the moment? I, th- I think again with your biases like you, you're conscious of thinking well they've done it and often sometimes they haven't um, and so what you, what you had to do is like I said probe, listen, check, understand and it's about getting going back to if you put it into a coaching context it's getting your preparation right so you've you've gathered, gathered all the information that you can to help with that process so for us as coaches if I'm doing a topic on 1v1 defending tonight like I said earlier about un- underpinning the uh, knowledge is the game's the underpinning knowledge so I get an idea of what 1v1 defending looks like so I gain my information prior to the session and I've got an idea of what it looks like and then I, and then the session is it takes place and then I um, do my bits, so to speak. So, for instance, if you go back to the police context, you get all your information, all your evidence prior to the interview and then you do the interview process and go through it but let them tell you their version of events. And sometimes it's true and sometimes quite often it wasn't. Um, but that's that's by the by. You just, and going in a coaching context, get your knowledge of the game, get your knowledge of the subject matter for that evening session and then work with the players around how do you get to where you think they can get to on that evening. Yeah. So getting that knowledge of the game, where do you where do you get yours? How are you studying and getting your knowledge of the game at the moment? A wide variety. Um, always has been. Don't know why. It's just a thirst for knowledge and love of the game. So it's watching anything from Premier League on the television, Premier League Live, which I've been fortunate enough to do. England, international football. I've watched Champions League football in Africa. And... I watch games on the school as we walk past when I'm walking into the town. So it's, it's just a really wide remit. So, for instance, lots and lots of non-league exposure, watching games at a variety of levels uh, and and just 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 the game, just watching and learning and listening and reading, talking to people, informal things. It, it's just... I, I, when I was working with the FA, one of the things I used to talk about was becoming a student of the game. And I don't, I don't profess to be the world expert on, on the game of football, but what I do know is that I commit time to trying to understand it better and that's all I would advocate and particularly when I was working on the air licence as I was finishing at the FA I would just encourage people to become students of the game yeah okay so let's jump into the to the time that you know your time with within coach education and, yeah. and, and development so what was you, you mentioned you started off as a yeah. regional manager for 5 to 11s yeah yeah so what what did that entail and what were some of the key things that you picked up in in that time yeah it, the the role as the regional manager with the 5 to 11 program was around the same time as the skills program was introduced to the FA and the primary role as the 5 to 11s was to look after the youth awards as they were so the module 1 2 and 3 the FA youth awards were introduced at about the same time and my Remit was to go out and deliver those across six counties in the northeast of Yorkshire, be involved in any national courses that was obviously we were allocated to, and then go and do in service events for the counties, working with teams, players, clubs that were in the five to eleven programme. So really working in foundation phase. So my CPD events would be working with a grassroots clubs under nine team or a grassroots club under elevens team. And and just that was the the way it was it was shaping. Um but again it was yeah, it was a privilege to do. Yeah, yeah it was. And that, well, that was the time that well, you and I came across each other. I think, uh, yeah. yeah, it was. I think a course at, up at Lancashire FA maybe, and, and just when the youth awards were starting yeah. out. And um, yeah, obviously, massive influence on on my own career yeah. and, and life and yeah. what have you. It's interesting when you when you mention like Lancashire County FA, and this is what I say about acquiring your knowledge as a coach. So when I came and worked for the FA, I always remember when I worked at Lancashire, for instance, 
I can remember seeing a guy called Pete Trevivian, who was again a colleague of ours who's now at West Ham United. And and I said to Pete at the time when I came to the FA, I couldn't remember what the event was, but it would have been something to do with the football leagues. I think I was working at Hull City's Academy then at the time, or Centre of Excellence. I was a part time coach there. And I must have gone to a football league event that Pete was presenting on at Lancashire FA. So whilst you link it to us working together on the Youth Award, and I've had some great experiences at Lancashire FA. Um, I, I also remember seeing Pete Trevivian there for the first time and what I remember and I said to Pete I can't remember the session that he delivered but I can remember the way in which he delivered it and that was probably the most significant thing and it was it would have been a games based practice but it would have been Pete's interaction with the kids on the day and what specifically can you remember I can't about? remember that but I just know when, when I came to the FA and the name Pete Trevivian was on the list of staff that I would be working with it took, took me back to that that event at um, Lancashire County Fair many years before and there must have been something about Pete that stuck with me. And it would have been, it, it's definitely got to have been about the way he coached rather than what he coached. I was lucky enough to work with Pete at the uh, Licensed Coaches Conference a few years ago now, back in, um, it, when, it was before Christmas. Yeah. And I was kind of Pete's compare while he was delivering a, a session with, um, with a group of under 18s. And he, what I noticed about him was A, this kind of magnetic connection that he had with these young men who just gravitated towards yeah. him. I couldn't get him off the pitch to, <laughs> to come and answer some questions yeah. with the coaches. Um, and when I finally did get him off the pitch to come and do some Q&A, you could tell he was just itching to get back on. Yeah. Um, and I, actually, I think it's on, that's on the, um, on the FA website as a resource. Yeah. And he, he really just had a, 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 a deep, it seemed to be a deep caring yeah. connection with the, the, yeah. the boys that he was coaching. 100%. Yeah. For me, it will have definitely been the how rather than the what with Pete. I know that because I can't remember the session. Yeah. And uh, I know I certainly learned a lot of lessons from Pete that day working with him, the, the way that he um, he just tried to, he, he, he was self-proclaimed non-academic. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he, when you dig into it, yeah. he seemed to have a real understanding Without being with it, without it being so yeah. explicit and formalised, definitely. And he's like you say, very self-deprecating. But then when you talk to him and he gives you the rationale as to why he's doing what he's doing, he's a, he's a deep thinker and he understands what he's doing. And, and like you say, he may he may put himself down in, in a lot of occasions, but he, he's definitely very clever when it comes to the working with young players. Yeah, At times I've seen him many times now. When I go into more of your your experiences your time with the FA and yeah. you're definitely the most prepared guest that I've seen with <laughs> you you've made more notes than I have in the pre before we started but um that's an age thing yeah tell us tell us about your your experiences um abroad because you were you, you started to talk about that before yeah. we hit yeah. record and I, and, I, and I paused you there to save it for the recording so yeah. um you mentioned something about uh your time working out in Rwanda and yeah. some of the lessons that you learned from yeah, the world yeah and, and this is one of the like when we talked about me leaving the police after being halfway through his pension and not wanting to look back with any regrets one thing working for the FA did was give me some fantastic experiences that I would never have got working in the police so for that I was, I'm eternally grateful and, and the FA is a great place to work I know I say you but the FA is a governing body you get a battering from many many areas but the FA is a fantastic organisation um, to work in and to represent and I feel proud to have done that um, and it afforded me lots and lots of opportunities to get better at what I do and and a number of those were coaching international courses so at the time there were partnerships and memorandums of understanding which I think still exist now so I was I was lucky enough to go and deliver international courses in Rwanda, Malawi and Burkina Faso in Africa and again New Zealand and Fiji so they're just, just experiences I would never have got and, and the, the African experience across all three but there was one particularly in Rwanda where I was doing a course and whatever great practice I was doing was and, and obviously just just to sort of backfill that was the, the, the FA would obviously liaise with the host organisation and they would either send out equipment to be given to the coaches at the conclusion of the course and equipment to help us deliver the course or they would liaise with the governing body in the foreign country and, and they would have sufficient equipment for us to deliver the course there um, so I remember delivering a session with whatever equipment I was using appropriate for the number of players that I had in the activity and one of the coaches at the end of the session said coach he said that was fantastic but I have one ball and 50 players and that I didn't give an immediate answer because I couldn't I didn't have the I didn't have the ability to answer his question but what it did it made me think about how do you then do that with one ball and 50 players and how do you keep those 
players engaged? Could you come up with practices or games? And then we got talking about things like whilst the game's going on and it might be a five minute game with the ball, then a side of it, you might have kids playing tag games, you might have them playing the old bulldog and stuff like that. And all the informal stuff that, to be fair, African kids do a lot of anyway. They, they play a lot of games. And when, when we're out there, you would see kids playing similar to school playground games when we were kids. Um, but it did make me think about resources as, as a, an aspect that we sometimes take for granted. Yeah, that, that's something that, you know, my, my knowledge and understanding of uh, the academy system and, and just the ins and outs is, is virtually none. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've often wondered, you know, how well resourced are you? So, if I, for example, if I was the um, uh, under-14s coach yeah. with you at Middlesbrough, you know, how, how, how would it be? Would I have as much pitch space as I want, as many goals? Is it, how, how would the you know, resources and equipment and facility, yeah. is there any constraints that would have to work around or is it literally you've got whatever you like? You, in, in the summer, so like nights, you'll, you'll have a pitch, full-size pitch for yourself. So if you talk around, the boys coming back in summer till probably the dark nights when we'd start to go on the, the 3G pitches. So we've got a out, full-size outdoor 3G and a, a 60 by 40 indoor pitch as well. But prior to that, Every team will have a full pitch to work on during the summer and obviously at the back end of the season in the, in the spring and summer bits. Um, during the dark nights, what we've tried to do is make sure that with training, every age group has at least half pitch to work on. And in, then in terms of equipment, you, they don't really want for anything. There's any, so anything from small mini goals all the way up to full-size goals, cones, bibs, balls, mannequins, ladders, hurdles, whatever you want and depending on the value of what you think the equipment should be used for they, they don't really want for anything thereafter and, and the reason why I ask is that's something that I get levelled at quite a lot yeah. when, when I'm helping coaches is that oh well um, you know you've got all the, all the equipment all the facility yeah. that you need and, and my, my argument back would be actually I, uh, personal opinion but one of the key skills of an effective coach is that ability to be adaptable and to, yeah. to, to respond to, to changes. And um, even in my own practice, I've got no idea how many are going to turn up on a Wednesday yeah. night. It's yeah. somewhere between eight and 20. Yeah. And we've got a, a, th- a third, sometimes a sixth of a pitch. Yeah. But you make, you make do with it. And, but I think that having those constraints uh, as early on in yeah. your coaching career, as most coaches do, yeah actually sharpens you up as a coach yeah yeah, I agree I think um, what it makes you do is think and, and it, it's interesting you said about being a grassroots coach so I'll tell you what I've noticed in the club as well it's not it's not unique to grassroots football um, I think the under 23s coaches in professional clubs depending on how they run but certainly in ours um, they have a good challenge and they have to use probably skills they've learned a long time ago in the professional environment so, I'll give you, so an example would be our under 23s we're fortunate that all the, the team are on one site so the first team train on the same site is in the 23s the under 18s all the way down to the under 9s so obviously during the day when they're in um, the first team might want some under 23s to train up on merit or just, just to have the additional numbers for the practice they're doing because obviously in a professional football club your first team is the priority um, and it's great for us that the boys have a pathway through to the first team but then what happens is our under 23s coaches I've seen them where they're, practice, they're preparing to do a session that day for maybe 14 players and then he'll get they'll get a knock twenty minutes before the session, saying that actually the first team will need five at twelve o'clock for training. So suddenly they've gone from fourteen to nine, but they've got to try and stay on the same theme of practice. And then they're going right, okay, well what we're going to do with this, we can compromise that, we can change that, we'll squeeze that in there. So the ability to adapt still exists even within a category one academy. And I think that's the thing I've said to the lads this year in, in the under twenty three is they've shown that ability to adapt and change sometimes at really short notice. Yeah. And, and I think that's a skill that if you've developed that in, in your grassroots or in your early years of coaching, it's going to stand you in good stead for the future. Yeah, I think it's it's just becoming less hung up on X's and O's and numbers yeah. and more about the experience yeah. and actually what well having a a combined uh, outcome. What do the players want, yeah. need, and, and and can we balance that off with what yeah. you know, we think they do? Yeah, and I think we talk about plan do review and what I would encourage people to do is think about that when you're in the planning stage and again we talk about planning can take many forms for grassroots coaches it can be in the car on the way to training because they're just leaving work and that's the reality of, of of being a grassroots coach but for me it would be plan forward in terms of I'm going to do this session tonight or I've got this outcome as my intended outcome for the session 
I'm going to plan for 0 to 9 players, 9 to 14 and 14 plus. And that's what I've said to the under 23 to take away some of that anxiety is stick to your theme, but plan for 9, plan for 14 and plan for 20. And that way you just, it's like picking the option that you need and, and you've, you've already planned forward for that. So it's not such a surprise. So you, you, you three African countries and you yeah. said, was it Fiji and New Fiji Zealand? Fiji New Zealand. The New Zealand was it was influenced quite a bit by um, English coaches, and there was a lot of a lot of staff on the football development teams in the New Zealand FA, and, and within their development pathway were English coaches or English coaching staff, and they, they were having the same challenges, obviously, with the, the rugby union being the biggest sport out there. But the participation rates at the time were increasing in, in football, um, but it was again a culture, and I think that they they had a number of challenges around participation. And the, the number of people that they had access to, and you even talk to the lads now about it, and they've they've still got a smaller pool of people to choose from at the senior level. But it was it, it was culture, really. Respect. They, they were they were good people. Um, I think that comes. It's got to be a spin-off. It can't be any coincidence from the the rugby stuff and the standards around. We all know the the stuff around the All Blacks and the legacy of sweeping the sheds and stuff like that. And I think it's just values again. Um, the the club we the base the course at was was very much about it was it was a local club um, family values um, respect for others and and yeah that that was very very evident out there yeah and that's something that I want to probe further when, when we get into your um, into your sort of day job work yeah. at the moment yeah. um, you talk, we talked before again about and this is something I didn't actually realise was one of the it goes back to that, that skill of communication uh, as, as a coach and your experiences of being a an international coach, which I, I had no, I know, for all the time I've known you, I had no idea about this. There you go, you see, not on me, I, I think it's on my CV somewhere, but yeah, it was just, I was I was very, very lucky um, for a number of reasons. In 2006, I was working with the the England Women's Deaf Futsal Squad, um, and because of circumstances, I was asked to be the head coach for the European Championships in Russia in November 2006. Um and yeah, we went out there in, as I say, November, getting off the plane in Moscow in the middle of November was an interesting experience. And I remember, I remember getting another anecdotal bit where we're doing, so we needed to do some ice baths for recovery. So instead of going and buying the ice from the bar, we just took the, the big ice boxes and cool boxes. We just took them outside the front of the hotel and filled them with snow <laughs> and brought them back for the ice baths. So me and the kit man, it was really funny. But um, yeah, so we, we went to the European Futsal Championships and we came runners up to the Horse Nation 2 0 in the final live on Russian TV. So again, great, great experience working with players. And what it did challenge was your communication skills. How? Um, well, you see, touchline behaviour, don't you, at any level of the game, and this is not unique to grassroots or professional, but any level of the game, on any day, you, you'll see touchline behaviour from. We're talking about coaches, so you see, we'll, we'll stick with coaches. Um, shouting and bawling and trying to get their messages across to the players to impact on the performance but working with players who were deaf you clearly can't do that so you had to find a way to be more effective with the communication and and that was around during the break times keeping things simple clear for them in terms of what you asked them to to do but then the minute they walk on the pitch you had to trust them you had to trust the players to be able to do what you wanted them to do or what they said they were going to do for you so it was about that was definitely for me it was about trusting the players more so two things then from that I'm guessing you went through an interpreter then yeah we had we had sign language interpreters with us as part of the squad um, but I felt it was appropriate for me to try and sort of find some basic understanding so good morning and things like that with signing to people and, and then when within the football context just some basic stuff about passing and pressing just really, really simple stuff that I tried to do. And then obviously when we would we'd talk with anything extensive, then the sign people would come in and do the signing next to me. Um, but what was really, really clear was body language. Because obviously it, with, them, with the mean deaf players, they take a lot of visual cues off how you look and how you behave in front of them. And and the non, going back to the linking it to them time in the police, your, your non-verbal signals were really, really picked up by the deaf players. And that was my next question, really, was how you, you said about the trust. How did you, what steps did you take to 
to build that trust with the players? Yeah, it was it was that really around trying to learn a little bit of basic sign language so I could communicate with them in, in their method of communication. Um, I think, do you know what, it's daft as it sounds, just smiling at people sometimes. Just having a smile on your face and saying good morning. It, made, it set the tone for the day, it really did. And then obviously within within the games, just to, st- it was a case of standing and thinking, of trying to rationalise what you're seeing and work out which bits are the most important bits for the players. And, and then obviously when we would have the break, so, and again, choosing your time, if you're playing futsal, choosing when to use your time out, but don't do your time out and then think about what you're going to say. You need to be ready to maximise the time you've got with the players. So we, we said, um, or we've, we've spoken in the past that, uh, about that, that touchline behaviour and if yeah. we're not careful you create a um, a generation of players who are who are dependent on the yeah. coach yeah. during the game yeah. so how did how did the um, the women's deaf futsal squad how did they cope during the game what was their coping mechanism that, that got them to a final uh, good characters they had a good leader I remember the captain well um, she was a good leader and she was one of the players that if, if they were struggling she would get the game by the scruff of the neck so to speak you would see her sort of come to the fore in terms of organising the team on the pitch um, they, had, they sometimes had ways of communicating so if you think about um, whilst they're running about on a hardwood floor if the, if it was sta- if it was stationary say for instance there was a corner or a ball out of play you'd sometimes see the girls would be stamping on the floor to get the verbal the echo and the, the um, rattle of the floor which would then draw the attention of the teammate who would look around and then they would sign at each other. So just even things like that were really, really clever. So if, if a girl was, say, for instance, going to go and mark a short corner and, and the ball was out of play as they were getting everything settled, the captain would often stamp on the floor. They'd look over the shoulder and she'd give us some message in sign language. And was this something that you'd you'd encouraged or worked on or was it something that had just kind of evolved? It was the something group? I had no idea about and I saw it happening and I thought, well, if that works for them, why am I to change it? Because it clearly did. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Again, talk about enriching me as a coach and, and someone who was doing this role. I found it fascinating. So as the game's going on, you're playing in a major championship yeah. final. What, what's going through your head during the game, knowing that you, you can't you can't shout and scream onto yeah. the pitch and, and, and directly instruct the play? Yeah. So wh- what's your thought process? I, my, my thought process is the game, what, which bits of the game are causing the most problems and it was literally trying to, there's a whole range of things going on but it's just which are the bits that are going to make a difference when we have the break and it was again not over complicating things for the players, it really was, I mean it, it's as simple as that, you know you can't impact by shouting and bowling so you've got to, going back to, to not his two eyes and two ears um, but your eyes predominantly in that environment was to just watch what's going on and, and be really clear in your messages when the players came off for the breaks. So it's actually just observing yeah. what's going on and, and planning for the time out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like going back to, again, observation skills being a, a different environment trait, different yeah. concepts. So using observation skills in two contexts, like I said. And I, again, reflecting back, this is where my background in the police and working on observation skills, transfer across into coaching and stuff like that. Yeah. I've, I'm, it's one of the things that does it... it it interests me a lot, does observation skills, what do we see when we look, is a question I've often talked about with people. And I know now you've got, certainly within our environment, you've got clubs who are using um, optical scientists or whatever they choose to call them, where they're looking at what do we track when we look at things. And they've, they've got them in working with the players, doing tracking, eye tracking exercises and things like that. Um, and that, that, does, that does fascinate me. Yeah. So one of the boys who was at the academy, went, uh, when I was at Hull City many years ago now, he's now um, optometrist. And I've had conversations with him about what do we what do we see when we look. And then on a recent on the last B licence I worked on for the FA, there was a, a major from the army who was on the course and he was a battlefield medic. And I talked to him about observation skills when you're going into the heat of a battle. What do you look for? What and, and it all comes down to contextual triggers and cues. So he was he was saying things like if you're doing a patrol and say for instance there was no kids on the street or there was no no bins on the street or whatever it might be or there's a, a wheelie bin has turned up that wasn't there the day before, and it was everything we do was really about contextual cues and triggers, so it's fascinating. But it's how we I would pick them up and I would track them, and I still haven't got to the bottom of that. 
No, so let's not go that. Expect me to give you some great answer here, and now that everybody can take away and go, there's the answer for our observation skills. I can't because it's something that still fascinates me. Uh, yeah, and it you got me thinking about, you know, what do we, what, what do we watch, or what do we think we're watching for yeah. when, when we're trying to help the players learn the game, yeah. or do we just get naturally attracted to the ball yeah. and yeah. Um, be an interesting thing to look at and to almost that that's that's exactly where it's going with me because I think there's some some research done and, and some of the listeners will no doubt know better than me around Sesame Street with kids about the placement of certain characters and certain product placement I think on Sesame Street about how the kids track things on the TV and that started to get me curious because it was about um, around for us in, in football how do we have the ability to look on around and away from the ball and that's that's why the observation skills bit still fascinates me now because I still see it even within academy football where I'm working now with good coaches, the around and away from the ball stuff, picking up those subtle cues and triggers are still the bits that I think if they, if they get good at that, that can make the difference. Yeah, it is a skill. And I think I've said this before that, you know, we're we're um we're spoiled for choice with football when it comes to what's on yeah. the TV and yeah. um but what I don't think helps is that, you know that that camera just follows the ball around, and it and that can. Uh, I don't know if it if that translates to how we watch the game live. Yeah. As as coaches, but certainly being able to almost step back. Yeah. And and take in more information yeah. that you can use uh, in a more appropriate way is certainly something that. Yeah, helps. I think I think that when certainly I've noticed when students come on the B license courses as they used to and stuff like that, and we started talking and put on around away from the ball. And we try and do as many practical tasks as possible where they were watching live games. So what I think is really good with the, the stuff you've been doing on the way for B and things like that. I know there's some tasks now um, about player profiling and then watching the players play and stuff like that. And we're going to be helping um, people from North Riding FA at some point maybe come and watch an under 18s or under 23s game um, to look at on that around and away from the ball stuff. And I was at the um, professional club's B licence course earlier in January and they did an exercise watching Hull City and Barnsley under 18s and for me that's where I think my observation of watching of lots and lots of live football has helped because you see things away from the ball that impact on what goes on on the ball and that's where I would encourage coaches listening to try and just watch a wide wide range of live football to try and just develop that on around away from the ball experience and it's a good link that you've got with the, the local county affair I believe yeah. Um, some CPD events you've had on recently yeah, yeah we've, it's been really good I mean obviously with me coming from initially a county FA background um, I can see the value in everybody working together because ultimately we just want kids to be better at football and coaches to enjoy their experiences in football um, so we were contacted by, or there was already a relationship ongoing with North Riding County FA but it was one that I was really keen to encourage and one of the lads in the office he looks after that relationship by I chip into the meetings or if he needs my approval to set an event up then obviously I'll give him the nod because it goes without question and we've done stuff where they've come to see the under 23s they've watched training the day before a game had a briefing with the coach and then they're watching the 23s game the next day and then had a question and answer with him in the afternoon after the game just just to get a, a, an understanding of what goes on in academy football we've also hosted two events with Pete Sturgis um, one for ourselves and our partner clubs and one for North Riding County FA and then we've got other things lined up with things like goalkeeper CPD so they're going to do an event with our goalkeepers um, and youth, youth development phase so for me we're an open door in terms of who we can partner up with and who, who wants to come in and watch what we do so I do get as you can imagine a number of contacts from coaches saying I'm interested in watching what you do in the academy I'm interested in being an academy coach of the future my answer is you're more than welcome um, obviously for me working in that environment got to go on back to the legislation now I just ask them to send me a copy of the current DBS and then link them up with the appropriate phase coach that they want to go and watch whether it's a grassroots sorry whether it's foundation phase youth development or they're interested in senior football generally they're more than welcome to come in so for instance we've got one now where we're probably going to do something with Bishop Auckland College on their degree course bring the students in for a morning to watch us training and do a question answer with the coaches yeah it's got, it's got to be. It, for me, I just see, also see it as potentially succession planning for future. So if I if I see coaches who are, I'm not necessarily just young coaches, but if coaches come into our club now, see the activities we're doing, enjoy what we're doing and, and go away and maybe help try and adapt that to their kids um, 
and at some point in the future they think I won't mind giving it a go as a coach at the academy but they've got the experience to know what the benchmark is standard of the players is to know what the benchmark standard of coaching is it just gives them a chance but also for me it's just again building relationships with people that can help you yeah that's fantastic so if you did have a coach that had ambitions of, of working yeah. in an academy yeah. um, whether it be your yours or, or any other what sort of advice would you give um, don't worry about the knockbacks because the knockbacks are all part of moving forward um, I would advocate them contact nearby club or clubs get in touch with the head of coaching express your interest would I be able to come in um, watch whatever you want and I would think knowing, knowing the heads of coaching I know across the clubs in the north of England I would think they generally get a pretty favourable response, um, because I just I just think the, la- the lads that I know working in clubs would see it as just as I've just articulated, whereby it's it's good back to build relationships, and it's good to try and maybe succession plan for the future. So I would say for people who've got aspirations, try and get into the environment to observe or see if it's CPD events that your local club are putting on with a partnership with the county FA, go and watch them, talk to coaches, um, and just just work at your craft. Yeah. Work at craft. So, so, for instance, we've recently had some interviews for foundation part-time foundation phase coaches, and I've got to say that the standard of the coaches that came was pretty decent, and they all they all did a good go at it. We've employed two of the lads because we had two vacancies. Um, well, and then so we've got three. I think it's three or four that we had to feedback on. So again, two have asked for feedback, and at the moment, two haven't. So that's fine because people are different. But the, the part of the feedback for the two that have asked for it is look, come in, come in and watch us working, come in and see, come and get to know the coaches, come and have a look at the phases that you're interested in and you never know whatever future vacancies crop up, you might then put yourself on the front foot in terms of where you stand in the hierarchy of opportunity. So that that's it for me. Yeah. So what stood out for you in those two that you, you did select? Or if you can't answer that, yeah. what what stands out for you um, when you're looking at a potential coach that you were, you're bringing into the, into the academy? Do they connect with the kids? That's that's the first one. Do they have a rapport with the kids? Do they connect with the kids? Um, it, it was what I what I found interesting and quite reassuring as well at the same time was and, and the way we did it, we did it similar to what we did when I was in the FA with the skills team. So we we brought them in. Um, they all did a session with the players. So with the under nines and under tens, they they got one or the other groups to work with. Um, did a thirty minute session and then had a chance to have a breather and reflect on their session. And then they did a formal interview in front of a three-person panel. And the first first part of that interview was, go on and watch your reflections on your session. And did we expect it to be perfect? No, because it never is. And mine, mine never are. So that's the other thing for me, for coaches, don't beat yourself up when your session's not great. Because just make sure you understand why it's not, and that's the key. So, so the stats, so the people that came to the interviews was to sort of review the sessions, and that was a starting point for the formal interview. And it was good. And going back to what I was going to say was, three of them did exactly the same session and session plan which tends to suggest to me that whoever's getting the messages out into the football community are doing a pretty decent job because the sessions were very appropriate for the tasks that they were set yeah. and it was interesting that they came up with the same session that's good yeah I think so yeah you you mentioned earlier about values yeah. in, in a previous role and um, that was one, something I wanted to ask you about because I know that as part of the uh, the audit process that, that the clubs are going through yeah. now there's there's more of a, a sort of holistic approach yeah. to to how you operate so what if you can share with us what you yeah. know, what are the values that that you and your club try to live by and and how does that yeah. look in practice yeah i mean i can share it with you because it's it's plastered all over the walls if you ever come to the academy and it's about humility respect and honesty um I can't necessarily talk about Middlesbrough without paying tribute to Dave Parnaby, who's obviously well renowned in football for, and and I think Dave's Dave's skills, which you, if you talk to people, were about his his dealings with people and having values and standards and behaviours and stuff like that, and and the the club values of honesty, respect, and humility were in place before I got there, and so the stuff I've been reading in my, in the months I've been in the job, that they stack up. And it is as it sounds. It's about being honest and open with your communications and your behaviours, respecting others, respecting yourself. And that goes... I was interested that Nicky Butter said something about boys coming into the academy. They should know everybody from the cleaner to the first team manager. And it's sort of that type of thing with us. The the kids are encouraged to just talk to people, 
engage with people, be respectful of adults and things like that. Um, and then have humility. Be be happy that you're a player in a Category 1 academy. And obviously what we talk about is their behaviours away from the building as well because they represent us even when they're in school. They, It's like anything, you're all, you're, you'll always be an FA member of staff no matter where you go and what you do. Um, I'll always be an ex-policeman, an ex-FA member of staff wherever I go and wherever I do. And, and what we're trying to advocate for our boys is, look, just represent us in the community with a bit of humility, respect and honesty. And and that's, that happens around the building. So you've talked about the boys in yeah. the way that that you um, you try and educate them and, yeah. and, and bring them up and nurture them. How do those values play out in your own daily practice? Because I imagine most of your dealing is directly with the coaches. Yes, yeah. 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 So I don't know if you could tell us, give us an example of um, how you might sort of hold those values or aspire to them. Um, I, I think sometimes trying to assert the values is a diff- difficult thing. You let them evolve. And I think that that is... For me, going in with those values already in place, they pretty much match what my personal values are anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've gone in and just been watchful over the first four, sort of six to eight months that I've been in the job and just looked at people's behaviours around the building and with each other and their interactions and stuff like that. And I think when you've got um, core values that everybody understands, you can just keep bringing people back to them. And it's about that being respectful, truthful, honest, um, it, I don't, I don't think asserting them is the way to do it. I think you let them evolve and, and people demonstrate them by subtle behaviours of, I don't know, picking kit up in the corridor that might have been dropped. So I, I, for me, it's so stupid, but I saw, I was in the corridor coming away from the kit room and there was a couple of dead socks obviously being dropped out of a kit bundle that had been taken back. And it was no more than 10 yards from the, the kit room, but I picked them up and took them back and dropped them in the basket and the, the lady in the kit room says to me, where were they? So I said, up the car. She said, you shouldn't have done that. Well, for me, it's just a simple thing. You pick up rubbish and you put it away, don't you? Um, and I'm not saying, again, I, I'm perfect, but it's just stuff like that. So we have things like coffee cups from the canteen and stuff like that left on desks and things. So it's trying to just clear them. But clear them. if you go back to the kitchen, take the cups in and stuff like that. So all the little insignificant things about your behaviour just shows your respect towards other people because obviously... The people that do the cleaning have got to come in and they've got a trolley. And sometimes that trolley can end up with 80 cups on it. But what we're trying to say is, look, just just help people by taking stuff back, cleaning up after yourself, picking up your kit, making sure you leave the change rooms tidy. So we were, we've were we been really lucky that we've been away with the boys a few times on the road and we, we stopped off, I'm trying to think, it was in the under-14s, uh, serve, motorway services, and as we're getting back on the bus, um, a, a man and his wife came up to us and, and they said oh we'd just like to compliment your boys on their behaviour they've, they've been in, in the services and they've conducted themselves really well they've supply and they just obviously with the in Middlesbrough kit and things like that but yeah. it's just nice when somebody comes up to you and says oh, by the way your kids have been great and you sometimes wonder what measures but just the fact that they've acknowledged it is, is good for us which means that the kids are representing the club in the way we would expect them to yeah, probably satisfying part of the job. I yeah, imagine. it's great. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it definitely is the the good kids. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a time. I think it was last summer actually, where um, the I found myself in it in an awkward situation. I was we were down at St George's Park for for something, and uh, I went to the gym as as I did as I do for five minutes every now and then, <laughs> and uh, and I went and I realised. Um, that I probably shouldn't have been in there. It was the, it was that. Well, a, it was the high performance gym. Yeah. So the, the, the clue is in the name. That I, <laughs> I, I didn't deserve to be anywhere near that, and I realised uh, when it was too late actually that the there was several of the under twenty one squad yeah. were were it were in there doing some maintenance work, and each one of them, uh, every time they walked past, you said that you know there's a power of a smile. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Yeah. How's your day been? Yeah. Just and and you felt that there was a genuine effort to. Uh, ask about your day yeah. um, and have a conversation and it's just small things like that even walking out holding the door you yeah know, yeah. Uh, no it's 100% open. I mean we where we are the, the, the main corridor through the academy building has first team staff um, academy staff boys first team players so the first team players are not aloof and out of the way they, they can cross paths with an under 10 player in the corridor and it's just that interaction engagement and that good morning just good morning Good morning, or you're like we we go in through a door into the academy, and you, when everybody arrives at similar times, 
you might be following first team players in or first team players might be following the other chief executive or whatever it might be and it's just just that holding a door for someone good morning yeah you said and I'll challenge this you said that it's those little insignificant moments yeah, but I yeah. think I think they're much more that I think yeah. they're very, ins- yeah. very significant moments yeah. that all add up yeah so that, that's how it plays out you know off the pitch yeah it does what yeah. about what about on the pitch either in, in training or on a match day yeah. how do those values um, permeate the, the training yeah. ground or the, or the match day I, th- I think in, in the training stuff it's around respect we want the boys to be competitive and and it is from 23's level all the way down it, it is competitive and which is good so there'll be physical contact there'll be players unfortunately getting injured in training but that's probably the byproducts of being in the environment we are and no, nothing ever done deliberately obviously of course but we keep bringing them back to the respect so if say for instance at, at, the, at any age group really there's a lack of respect shown towards a teammate in a training session so that made some verbal I don't know bantering I don't like the word banter but some, some of the lads may well be disrespecting each other yeah I think that's that's the best way and it might be because of performance or they've just got injured or they've just done something wrong that's what we pull them back up on and how do you do that because that's a question that I get asked quite often by, by coaches grassroots coaches who are working out there predominantly with with teenagers yeah you know and they they, they have these similar situations yeah. so how do you deal with it you, you've got to deal, generally deal with it there and then and you've got to just make reference to it I don't want an overbearing situation where we're stamping our feet with the kids all the time but it's just got to be Jack that's not acceptable done publicly or privately I, or? I think sometimes it can be both so within the midst of a game it might well be uh, I'll shout Jack and you'll look and it might just be a point and a raise of the eyebrows or no, it might be a drinks break so you find your way towards the same boy as there's a drinks break going on and you say well, do you think that was okay what you did to whoever and they'll go well he did so and so to me and he did so and so and they say well okay I'll do that but do you think the way you spoke to him was appropriate no and then you just got to get him to recognise that their behaviour is not appropriate yeah. so there's again there's a multitude of ways it can happen and I think within your head you've got to have a scalability in terms of do you deal with it with a, a, a quiet talk as the drinks break or do you do it at the end of a session quietly or do you do it in the moment and again it's like anything with coaching that only comes with practice mm. but if you've got your boundaries then at least you know it's got to be dealt with so because that falls outside of what we consider to be respect towards teammates yeah. so that's the right okay what's the best way for me to deal with it with that boy in this situation yeah um, it goes back to a phrase that has been used often and which is um I'm, I'm thankful is becoming more and more common is, is that it depends yeah, it does rather than just yeah. being so um uh having a flag planted firmly in the ground about this is the way that it yeah. will be dealt with every single time yeah. actually recognizing the, the the uniqueness of the yeah. situation yeah 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 because yeah, we, we yeah because the individual stuff goes back to and like you said the it depends thing the, the one thing for me in terms of my learning is over recent years is to read and watch and listen and the it depends stuff is it keeps cropping up keeps cropping up and I've been to a number of seminars only recently I went to one and, and the, the the emphasis of that was it depends it depends it depends in terms of trying to improve the place te- technically tactically physically psychologically but also when you align it to your behaviours and values again it depends on the best way to do it with that player at a given time and the only way and the only way you really can help with that is if you take the time to develop relationships and get to know the individuals what's behind the behaviour so we were, we were having a talk in fact it was around practice design so it's not necessarily disrespecting behaviour but we were talking about when the boys might be doing a practice that the coaches set up and the co- and the boys start to mess about within the practice and the, the normal default for coaches to, to have a go at the boys about look that's not acceptable why are you messing about I've said to the, some of the staff in our office the other day about think about why that behaviour comes to the fore is it because the practice is boring or not challenging them enough? And in our context, is it not challenging the boys enough? So therefore, they've started to just misbehave because they're bored. So instead of just assuming it's the boys misbehaving, maybe look at the reasons why they're misbehaving and it might come down to something you've done or not done prior to that point in the session. Yeah, and the, the mirror is... Uh, yeah. Is it better to go to the yeah. mirror than the window? Yeah. I think my, my... As I've got more experience and got older, my first thing I always do... Is it me? Is it me? I look at every everything I do, whether it be doing something around doing the plans for the club or whether it's planning coaching sessions or coach reviews or meetings, 
something crops up that I wasn't ready for or something crops up that's wrong or something that I've been involved with that doesn't come out as I expected, I don't look to portion blame first. I look and think, is it me? And I think that's that's the first thing yeah. I look at. It's a good habit to get into. Yeah. Because even if it's not directly me, I've probably been a contributory yeah. factor in the first place. And that reminds me of, I think it was uh, uh, Merv Roberts. He's done a lot of work yeah. in the... Um, the psychosocial side yeah. of the, uh, the way that coaches are educated on the on the advanced youth awards, and he talks passionately about repairing the relationship. So yeah. you've had that incident, you know, where things haven't quite gone yeah. to plan. You might have had to um, speak to one of the players about their behaviour, but actually separating the behaviour yeah. from the person. Massive. Like it's not you; it's, yeah. it's your behaviour. Yeah. And then repairing that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it could be. You know, they've got that club kit on, but yeah. inside they might still, you know, yeah. be fragile. Yeah, it's interesting. That's that's the biggest. Well, one one of the things I've seen moving into uh, the category one academy program from primarily working in grassroots football, um, they are still kids. They are still kids, and I and I talk. I mean, my my son's nineteen now, so he's obviously the same age as our our professional development boys, eighteens, nineteens, just passed his driving test in the last year and things like that, and. We're, we're looking at our lads and getting concerned because they're driving a bit quick in the cars which is understandable but it's that still they're not fully mature adults yet even at 17, 18 they're still young boys and they'll make some errors of judgement so don't castigate them for it because have we not made, made errors ourselves when we were 17, 18, 19 yeah we have so you've just got to try and keep things in proportion and scale and I think that's it like you say working with young, young players so any, anywhere from whatever age kids get involved in the game it's not them it's their behaviours and I think trying to separate the two is is it's a good skill to be able to do if you can going back to again something we, we spoke about earlier and it was it was about success and, and measures of it so yeah. what you know in your role now in the club yeah. what what are you what would you say the measures of success for for your academy yeah and, and as part of our role um, we're asked to produce an academy performance plan which is the official document that we present as our our statement of this is what we are, this is what we do, and the evidence for the triple P, and and part of that is what we call productivity, which which academies are measured on. So within that, we do have a productivity um, section. For me, whether it's category one academy professional football or whether it's grassroots football, the ultimate success is retention of people within the game. And for for professional football, we we talk about we have player audit meetings where we talk about young players coming through we're going to sign on professional contracts for Middlesbrough Football Club or other boys that we can get a, hopefully a career in the game elsewhere and if not a career in football how we can then help them with a career elsewhere in terms of helping them with the life skills and their educational studies that are going to help them for a career elsewhere and hopefully they'll stay involved whether for our boys it's in non-league football semi-professional football grassroots football coming back into coaching potentially administrators referees whatever it might be, that they're still engaged in the game. Because we all know the dropout figures in professional football by the age of 21, the number of players that drop out of the game is, is alarming. So we're looking at, can we can we provide lads for a pathway to something beyond Middlesbrough Football Club if they're not successful? And I think we were talking earlier where I said, I, I can certainly state without fear of contradiction that we, we spend probably as much, if not more time, talking about the boys that are struggling across all the phases as we do with the ones that are flying, because I think I think it's really important. And like we, we were talking earlier about, one of the rewards for me as a coach, whether it's grassroots or professional football, is ten years after you've seen a boy or you've you've kept in contact with them, but you get a knock on the door, a telephone call saying, "Oh, I'm applying for a job. Can I put you down as a reference?" It means you've probably had some impact on the development of that person, and not just the footballer. And I, and I think that's the you hear the story about. Well, they're not all going to be professional footballers, but they are going to be within society as good people. And I, th- I personally take that as a as a nice pat on the back for me, where you have to provide a reference for lads you've had some contact with. Yeah, likewise. I mean, I, I only visited a, one of the UA for B courses that we um, have got running in the northwest last weekend, and one of the learners on the course was a boy that I coached as an under yeah. ten. Yeah, and so he's now for, still playing, but also forging a route into coaching. Yeah. As a, I think, a, I think twenty-one year old, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, a, you know, a really proud moment just to see someone yeah. that you, you you might have had some sort of impact at some point, yeah, 
down the yeah. line, but they're still involved in the game and yeah. giving something back. Yeah, 100%. And I think for us, obviously, at Middlesbrough, over the years, we've had a good reputation of getting players through into the first team. And that's continuing. We've, we've got lads in the first team this year. Dale Fry, for instance, Ben Gibson, the club captain, come through the academy. We've had a lad, Marcus Tavernier, who was played half a dozen games early in the season, scored the winning goal against Sunderland in the derby, but he's now gone out on loan. Because at this point in time, that's considered to be the best thing for his potential long-term career, yeah. to get some football league experience ready for the summer when he'll come back in for pre-season. You talk about the success that you've had too. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you think it is that p- potentially makes what you guys do at the academy different for, say, other clubs around the country? Um, I don't, it's interesting because I don't know that it's different anymore. I think more and more people you talk to, more and more people you see, they're starting to recognise that it's it's about the individual that's important and it's about like we've said there whether they are soft skills as people call them but actually they might be the skills that make the difference is is recognising the in this context the players are all different and trying to maximise each individual player's opportunities and potential and I'm seeing lots of good practice across all the academies with that um, when I talk to heads of coach you know when we go to meetings and things like that it's often about how do we work with all the players and like I said to you earlier about the, the ones who will go on to play in the first team um, but the ones that won't as well those conversations are had continuously um, what do we do differently? I don't know that we do really no. No. Well, one, well one thing I get asked a lot by coaches is the the, the work that goes on psychologically so yeah. socially and yeah. how do you um, how do you incorporate that into the work that yeah. you, you do we, and maybe what what lessons could a coach who only has an hour a week with their players learn from from the way that you work with your players. I think we're lucky enough again because we we have full well we have full time psychology staff to support the kids. We have full time sports science staff. They we have um, a number of age groups coming on day release and stuff like that. So we have education provision as well, um, medical provision as good as you've seen anywhere. Um, but it, it is still all about the people so the multidisciplinary approach so the, all the different departments talking to each other about the welfare of the boys so for instance if if we've found a boy that might be struggling for instance we might speak to the psychologist about the work they've done with him or the work they could potentially do with him to address that because they're the expert in their field so again recognising that as a coach we've got a certain skill set but it, we can't conquer everything ourselves and using the resources that are out there for us within our building is, is good but it still comes back to with the psychologist ultimately she'll come back to the coach and we'll talk about the ways we can implement things but it's primarily through the coaching and it'll be doubt around us separating the behaviours from the person the subtle things around praise when it's appropriate and then obviously if you need to control or rebuke them then do so but in an appropriate manner um, but not, nothing greatly I mean if you're working one hour a week with a grassroots club and, and a grassroots team, it's about, again, knowing the individual. Chances are, because it's from a localised area, you've got a reasonable idea of the background, you possibly know some of the parents. Um, but I would say just just generally treat, treat kids fairly and equally and consistently, because I think kids need consistency. Because if you say one thing to one and another one gets away with something, I think this goes, but you said about Merv Roberts earlier, about social construction and the boundaries and stuff like that so if you get we for us like our values if your club values are pretty clear and you're consistent with the application of them then the kids the kids appreciate consistency it's when you start to step outside of that and you treat one differently to another and maybe stepping outside of the boundaries that you've set as a group that that steps in and it forms wedges and can be um, detrimental to developing a good environment our under 12s for instance won a, a big project this year by the Premier League called about Passchendaele linked to the Truce tournament and that, and that was really good and it gave the kids a real cultural awareness and made them work together as a group to, su- to succeed at this event and, and they did really really well and I'm, and I'm just thinking across where the people in the education team and then the people in the psych team are then worked with the coaching staff just to help just to help boys and, and it does come down to like you said their loyalty and respect for your boys it's pretty much the same so when, when the lads are disrespecting each other in training or whether it's around the building, then that's where... And, and the interesting thing is now we're starting to see, particularly for the under-14s upwards, where they're starting to have leadership groups. We're starting to say to them, can, can they sometimes regulate the behaviour within the group even before it gets to the coaching staff? Mm. Because if they can, that's even more powerful. Yeah. 
I mean, I was talking, we were talking the day with um, Rick Shuttleworth and a meeting that I was at, and we were talking about leadership groups within rugby and things like that. And now, obviously, they're senior international players, but I think kids do it at school these days. They do leadership programs at school, and so I often I talk to our coaching staff around what does education do? What they do in education now? Well, they do leadership projects when they're 14, 15, 16. So why can't we do that within the football context? So our, our psychologist is doing some good work within the 14s on leadership and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's good. What does that look like? Um, the boys have to express an interest in to want uh, to, to do it, first of all. It's got to come from them. It's not a case of, right, we need four of you to be the leadership group. Um, it's around, we'd like to have a leadership group. Would you like to be involved? This is what's going to entail and then a number of meetings and, and some stuff with one-to-ones with the lads and things like that. Um, but it's just trying to identify... And it's a mixture of characters as well. Sometimes it's not the ones you expect. So the, the, some of the lads have stepped forward and said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be part of that. And then so they get a little bit more work with the psychologist, but it's then expected that they would maybe disseminate some stuff to the boys and maybe some, sometimes regulate their behaviour. Um, if, for instance, they're going on a, an away trip or if, if they're going on an international tournament, there might be... The one I, I think it's a good thing. It's something we might continue to look at developing in terms of ownership with the, the boys. I think it's good. Yeah, it's not necessarily something that will naturally develop if it's left to chance. No. It's actually building this into the programme of work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, and well, that you said about you know the working with your coaches. So, what what's the sort of um, What's the bulk of the work that you're you're doing or your interactions with, with the coaches in yeah. the moment in practice? Um, the bulk of work I've been... So the first few months of the job, I was very conscious of not going into a Middlesbrough, which has been an academy with a great reputation, and going, hello, I'm Andy Foster from the FA. Is how we're going to work in the future. So I spent the first good number of months just observing what was going on and looking at the dynamics of interactions of staff together, the, the kids, the coaching how everything fits together on the multidisciplinary aspects because that was all pretty, I mean, I knew it existed, but it was new to me. And then just looking at where I can add value. So if I give an example, on the the professional development table, we had four staff, under 23s, lead and assistant, under 18s, lead and assistant, um, and one one of which was Jonathan Woodgate, who's played for England and Real Madrid. One so, of the best players who's <laughs> ever played in a Newcastle shirt, yeah, in my opinion. That's the biased opinion, Jaffa. Well, uh, Jack, yeah. But so, so Jonathan was the under 18s assistant, and then the other, all the other three staff on that table, I think, have played in excess of 300 league games. Whereas I got released at 18 as an apprentice from Grimsby Town. So I'm looking at them thinking, right, I can't give them any more game knowledge than probably exists on that table, 1,400 games between them. So it's not, it's not finding where can I add value to them. So Jonathan was starting on his pathway, just doing his UFB and stuff like that. Um, and the other lads were vastly experienced, but it's sort of looking at where can I add value for them. And, and the same applies to the lads in the foundation phase and the PDP, sorry, the youth development phase and the goalkeeping staff. It's where can I add value? And there I suggest from my time at the FA, my coaching background and stuff like that, I think I'm pretty reasonable around practice design some of the skill acquisition stuff um, and obviously the, the interactions of people, building relationships, developing relationships, all that type of stuff. So that, so that's what I've done and, and now it's just trying to implement it. So we're at a stage now, I met with the academy manager only this week about my work programme going forward, so to speak. Now that I've got a good understanding, I think, of how things all fit together. So I think I'm going to do um, two weeks phase specific. So I'm going to do two weeks foundation, two weeks youth development, two weeks professional development in our six week block of which we have our multidisciplinary meetings. And that'll give me a chance to, to do a little bit of intense work over two weeks with a the group, then leave them be so they can have a breather from me and they can practice and try to implement some of the stuff that we maybe talked about whilst I'm working with the other two phases. Then I come back in the next six week block and see them again. Mindful of the fact I'll still see them around the building and there'll be times when I see them still doing some work, but I won't be focused on it. I'll be focusing on the next phase. And and I think that's the way I'm going to work to try and be most effective with my time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the bulk of my work at the moment, working like that. Developing people. Developing people. Yeah, so what, when do you get the time to develop yourself and, and how do you do that? Uh, I still do. I podcast in the car. So I, I listen to podcasts. I read a lot. I, I try to watch. I'm, I'm on social media with Twitter. Um, and over the years, I've enjoyed reading stuff and connecting with people and, and copy and pasting documents that I shared or just just connecting and stuff. Um, watch, still watch games at variety of levels, 
for anywhere from up here Northern Counties East League up to Northern uh, Conference North with North Ferriby up to obviously our first team level that I've been able to see um, and and I've been I've been looking at I'm on a program called EOC with the Premier League which is Elite Heads of Coaching Award where the Premier League are running a program for us which I think is going to be a three or four year program and we we obviously go meet as a group doing some formal stuff but also the induction was a five days in the Lake District which you'd have loved but it was it was mountain biking um, river walking um, abseiling caving really really good and meeting different people and, and the focus of the course is primarily not the football it's about you so we had a, we had a talk on the final night at dinner with Brian Ashton which was really good um, he talked about disrupting things and trying to push things forward we support as heads of coaching we're supposed to be the people who innovate and drive the future of football coaching and professional football so that was good um, and we've got a couple of get togethers since um, and then I've been lucky enough that I'm also a master coach one of our staff at the club is on what they call ECAS which is the elite coaches apprenticeship scheme with the Premier League and he has a coaching cell around him uh, which is a representative from the Premier League a professional skills mentor and a skills mentor and then somebody else from, from the organisation and I'm, I sit on that group and I said the other day when we had a meeting the best thing about that is he's not the only one learning so I, for me being sat around there helping him with his club specific stuff I'm getting other things out of it and connecting with other people that I'll benefit from so yeah I think that's important still yeah and and obviously you, you said about Twitter being a, a an influence and this I've managed to troll quite a few questions that have come <laughs> in off that, that which I'm going to um, throw at you in a moment yeah. and but it's something you just said there that made me think uh, you, you you know I've been involved in this thing we call coaching for a long time yeah. now um, so you've seen it evolve since you first yeah. got into it uh, what do you see as the future of coaching or what does the coach of the future look like um, it's, it's going to be I, I worry a little bit and I don't worry I don't know let me think I think there was a phase and I don't know if it stopped yet or if it's still ongoing where because coaching can now be sick, what EPPP has done is created a, a wide number of jobs within professional football and if you look around now there's a lot more jobs available in coaching than there used to be and I think my worry is that young people will stop playing the game earlier and I think part of part of being a coach is playing the sport it doesn't matter what people say oh you but you're not playing professionally I don't think you need to play professionally I think you need to play the sport with any level of competence to actually just help it inform some of your coaching and I worry that I hear too many stories of coaches that have stopped playing at very 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 young ages in pursuit of a career and because of potential I said there's a lot of jobs but sometimes the jobs that they aspire to there's bottlenecks and there's a lot of people out there trying to get them so I hope I wish that maybe some of those coaches would carry on playing longer and consolidate their knowledge and stuff like that um, future coaching someone it's got to be about people I think in the past there I suggest it's been too much about your knowledge of the game there's been a, a game snobbery so if you don't know the game and you haven't played the game you, there's no route for you within coaching I think these days if you've got a reasonable level of competency maybe as a player um, and you go out and do your reading and you're observing and you're talking to people and your informal stuff plus you can connect and behave with people and interact with people I think that's a coach of the future mm. got, got to be again student of the game student of the game and student of people yeah. and I think in um, in the area that, that you work in and, yeah. and myself in, in a different capacity is, keeps coming back to this word learning yeah and you know, how do we impact or not on that I don't know because um, I, I don't I don't know how we measure it I, I find the difficult thing in football people saying how do we measure it and I'm absolutely astounded because I don't know myself I, I was listening I don't know if it was a radio programme or a podcast um, in the car and I was driving and it was talking about coaching and it was about yourself and things like that and if you had to sort of describe yourself in one statement what would it be and for me the, I, were re I was really clear and by the time I got home I thought about my like, one line it was I'm excited by the things I still don't know and I think that's possibly maybe a little insight into what I think about coaching of the future I acknowledge there's no finish line and that there's always something somewhere that you can find or seek out that might make a minuscule amount of difference but it'll make a minuscule amount of difference to make you better 
and that still excites me now. Um, yeah. I came home and told my wife it, and she looked at me laughing, but but it was. Yeah, I'm still excited about the things I don't know. And I think that sums up what I, I've known about you for all the time that we've worked yeah. together. And if I was to sum it up, it would be a, no ego. Um, which and that, I think that statement there, yeah. being, being excited about the things that you don't know, really sums what I know of you. Up, yeah, yeah. Being that lack of ego. Thanks. Um, I still I notice you've still kept your habit of uh, sitting down facing the exit. <laughs> which, which back is to the back to the wall. One of your strange traits that I've never been able to uh, to to get out of my head. So I'm going to um, jump on and uh, and fire some questions at you yeah. that, that came in off off Twitter now. Um, feel free to, yeah. to pass or or, yeah. or, or, or answer that, that's your decision and then after that I've got some regular questions that, that yeah. we've asked everyone that's come on okay. um, most challenging group of people that you have to work with in your in your role um, I don't know if it's challenging it's and I wouldn't say there's a singular group of but what I think the one of the challenging roles is trying to integrate within a club environment all the different disciplines to maximise the benefit because not just in our club but across sport at the moment there's this thing about our sports scientists taking over the world and and things like that but for us I think it's finding that balance and again we've made steps to have athletic development meetings where the coaching staff work with the sports science staff on planning six week programmes this is just in the professional development phase at the moment so it's trying to go right there's, a, there's our next six week block what does that look like so we talk about having a football bias or a gym bias or a neutral week and it's based around the fixture programme and the schedules for the players to try and maximise the, the physical side of it with sports science but also the football side of it and then integrating all of that so I think the biggest challenge within a professional football club environment in the academy is trying to integrate all the different disciplines to make to make maximum chance for the kids yeah, and I think, players. and does that? I can only imagine that that challenge grows as the category level of the academy. Yeah, uh, yeah, increases. It, it, it's interesting because Matt Crocker from the FA came into the club yesterday and, and was doing a club visit as part of his role with the England teams. Um, and we, we were talking about that, and I think it just comes back to we've got to all understand we're there for the player, and I, and I think. The you said about ego a short while ago. I think everybody's got to understand that we all play a part. Yes, the coaching is significant and possibly the most significant. And even the guys at our place, in terms of the sports science staff, would go, "Well, the coaching has got to be the bit that leads because it makes a difference." Um, but if we can do the physical stuff right, which which is good, we can even add more value to the coaching. And that's that's trying to get that blend. So I think I, I'm still seeing some some stuff to we've got a way to go on it but we're starting to talk to each other about we're not starting we're constantly talking about it yeah. and does that extend into the nutrition as well yeah we've we've had unfortunately we, our nutritionist was with us but has gone and, and got a job elsewhere so the nutrition side of it is definitely yeah covered um, educating the boys so sometimes like even now the young lads when I've been away with the under 18s the, the diets this is the other thing where their diets reflect society unfortunately so Prior to being obviously full time young players, they come into the club at 16. Prior to that, at 16, we can advise them and guide them, but the mass, the majority of their time is away from the club. Whereas when they're with us, they can eat breakfast at the club, lunch at the club, and then obviously they go home. So we're having to try and educate them to the benefit. We're as potential elite athletes as they're going to be, it's trying to maybe a little bit change the mindset so that food is fuel. We were talking about this the other day with a group that actually, yes, we all we all like nice food, but the boys have got to understand that for them as athletes, food can often be just fuel mm. and it's essential that they do it. So we've got a couple of lads who've started to tie late in games. So now we're having to say to them, look, there might be reasons for that, which is, it's, it's one of those where you don't necessarily want them to tie in games and affect their performance, but in a, in a long-term view, it's not a bad thing because we can use that as a reference point to educate them about their nutrition and preparation for games. So, yeah, the challenge is trying to get all the disciplines to coordinate for the benefit of the players. Yeah, OK. Um, England DNA? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was around sort of at its inception when a lot of conversations were being had around what it was and why we were going to do it. And I, I think it's got value because um, I think it says to people, this, this is what we're about, this is how we're going to try to do things. Um, it's given a clear framework the in possession out possession transition set plays um, 
and it's there for people. And I know we're like, for instance, Pete Sturgis has done some work on it for the 5 to 11 programme. So it's not something that the FA have gone, this is what we're about, we're keeping it. We're going to tell you about it, but we're not going to let you know what it looks like. I think with Pete's work, he's gone, this is what it means to the 5 to 11s. And by the way, here's a lot of stuff that you can take away and try with your kids. And I think that's been brilliant. Um, as I say, Matt Crocker was in yesterday and he gave a, he gave a talk to our staff around the DNA and why they did it and what it means and it broke it down even further into an international context for ours because obviously we've got some young players that go through the system with England from under 15s to the under 20s and, and obviously Ben Gibson at the first team level was with the, the first team last year and it's good that we get insight into what's happening and what I said to Matt yesterday is around the sharing I think that's the thing for me I think in the past it was a little bit of a we're going to keep this for ourselves and not really tell you what you're doing. And I think as soon as you open doors and engage with people, you get back, you get you get paid back by people because they start to go, do you know what? They're sharing stuff. And I like that. Even if they don't agree with it, at least we're saying this exists and this is what it's about. Yeah. So I think I think it's been a good thing. And then, so how do you, you know, you speak to the boys who've maybe been away on international yeah. camp. What's the what's the feedback that you get back from, from those guys? I've, I've not spoken to any of the boys that have not enjoyed it. So they, they say... This is, like I said, the, the staff and Matt were saying yesterday, what we're saying to you as clubs is, when the boys come to us, this is how we're going to work with them. And and it's really open. And, and I know like Marcus Tavernier, who's out at MK Dons at the moment on loan, he'd been away with the 19s. And I, I was curious, because obviously I left the organisation as this was all evolving. And talking about the in-possession, out-possession model with the integrated coaching group within the age groups. And it's just it's just interesting. And Matt, Matt talked a little bit more about it yesterday, about how it had come from different sports and things like that. And it, it prompted some good discussion, which I think for me, like with the, with Mick and Mick Matthews, who's our FA Youth Coach Developer, Matt coming out yesterday. We had an in-service event last week where Matt Portis from, from the FA was there. And I, and I think from a club environment, just seeing the FA coming in and sharing stuff is important. And I'm, obviously when I work for the organisation, I, I would let anybody see stuff I'm doing because there should be no secrets. Yeah. There's a lot of common common purpose and common yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. We we all want the best for the players ultimately, yeah. and that was one of the conversations with Matt towards the end of the day. Was it's down to working with the individuals again. Yeah. Got to know your players. And that and that brings you on to the the next question then, which would be common misconceptions that you hear about the academy system. Yeah, yeah. So what would like we were, we were talking before we went on Mike, weren't we about when we do not just our player audits, our player audits are where we're planning forward for recruitment or for lads who are going to get contracts and stuff like that. But we go all the way down to the under nines. Um, and and we, I've been involved in some very caring meetings, talking about the boys and it's talking about them as performers, but it's also talking about them from a welfare aspect as well. So if we if we think a boy may be struggling, we've t- tried to talk about well, what's best for him now. And if a boy's flying, that the ones that are doing well, usually take care of themselves along the way but you've got to be mindful of at some point if they have a dip how do you then help support them around that so the the welfare and well-being boys is talked about constantly so and and that's not just unique to us I I talk to staff in other clubs and I've been to other clubs where I see them working with staff and we we talk uh, uh, we talk about look what do they do well with their kids what do we do or what could we add to that but it ultimately comes down to we've got coaches who care about the kids and that's the most important bit so that sharing of ideas is is, is really yeah. crucial. Yeah. So, so where else do you do you look for ideas? Obviously, you know, obviously there's other clubs, but other sports yeah. or other organisations. Where do you where do you get your? We, we've got opportunities. I mean, I've got um, a friend of mine who's the assistant head of academy at the City of Old Rugby League Academy, which is a combination of Full FC and um, Hulkingston Rovers. So that's across another sport. Um, we've got ice hockey, basketball. We've got access to a variety of sports. But one of the things that has come to fall re- recently for me is contextualise evidence because yeah you can go and get something I'm trying to do something recently on Twitter and I can't remember because I wasn't intelligent enough to, com- to contribute but it was something about if something's in a different context to the sport you're involved in does it have value and there was a yes and no argument which you always get with everything and there was probably somewhere in the middle it depends um, but I'm trying to go when I, when I see any opportunity where will it fit for us does it work so I for instance I went to a recent one where I went to a CPD event at Leicester Tigers Rugby and it, it, I just I just found it on the social media I thought that would be good because it would be interesting and it was it was Dave Collins and Annie McNamara talking about the PCDEs and psychology and stuff like that PCDEs being 
psychological characteristics for developing excellence. Yeah. So I went to that session primarily with rugby coaches, but lo and behold, I was sat next to two coaches from cricket and one from volleyball in front of me. So that was good to talk about things that were going on. So I'm looking for opportunities. I'm going to one, I think it's 27th, end of February, UK Coaching Summit or the Applied Research Conference at Manchester. So just trying to just keep finding little bits that might help me. Yeah, I think that, you know, personally speaking, I've learned so much from just getting outside of the, the, the bubble, bubble of football. Yeah. Um, but I think, I'm pretty sure it was Ben Bartlett that said it on an, on an earlier episode, that, and it's stuck with me since, that um, we should perhaps be less magpies and yeah. more about filing cabinets. Yes, and, and yeah. Don't just steal and copy and paste because yeah. it's quite uncritical. Yeah. Just, um, you know, by all means, expand your horizons, yeah. but recognise the relevance of context That's always. That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah, great analogy. I mean, one of the people I do talk to a lot personally is a friend of mine who works in child welfare and development. Um, he, he's worked with disruptive kids in children's homes. He's worked in schools where kids are removed from mainstream education. And he's someone I have lots of interesting, fascinating conversations with in relation to child welfare and child behaviours. And there's always loads of crossover because ultimately they're all young kids what we work with in sport. Yeah. Um, and the behaviours sometimes outside of football are, are reflected in the football environment, but also sometimes the behaviours outside of football is the football bit that gets the kids as the anchor to sort out the other side of it. Mm. So it's again... I mean, again, we have a really good education team that link with the, the schools where the boys go to. And, and sometimes we have to sort of sanction the boys within the football context for the, the good of the education bit or the, the, the family bit. So it's about everybody's got a part to play in the development of the young players. Yeah. yeah, And exactly the same in, in, in the grassroots environment yeah. as well. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, 100%. I, when I was coaching my, my, first, my eldest lads team and, and even, even my youngest lads team, it was always about... What you what you been up to at school and what I remember with my first lad, one of the dads used to come to me and say, I don't know what you do with my lad, but every time he comes to train and he behaves himself, but he's a little rascal at school. And he was a football. And then what I would do during training or games, I would say to him, I said, Flipping it, your dad's been telling me what you've been up to no good at school. What's that all about? Oh well, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. Why? And then I could sort of feed feed into that. And I and I just think so and that and I'm talking probably twenty years ago now. So for me, the people bit is something I've probably always had in a way. I don't know why. And I've often thought, again, things that make you curious. I've always thought, why am I pretty reasonable at dealing with people or reading people or communicating with people? And the answer is I don't know. And I don't know that I'll ever know, but I just it's something I'll continue to work. I don't take anything for granted, um, but I just want, just want to treat people yeah. right. So, so given all that and... and you know, this is might be a bit of a tough question. Um, if you could change anything about the academy system that you find yourself in, what what, what would you change? Um, I see a lot of people worried about audits and inspections and things like that. And if you look at if you sort of relate that to coach education in this country for us, where we we've worked during a period where the FA have chosen to go from snapshot assessments to in situ, working closer with people, developing relationships, seeing what's good on a daily basis. I think that's that's the fear now because people got all the audit clocks ticking. We know it's going to be an audit on X date, X date. I think possibly developing that as a more ongoing system of assessment or whatever you want to call it, whereby your club support manager comes in, looks at the good you're doing. Yes, it's still consistent. It's still as good as it was last time. Or oh, you've added that to it. That's really good. Not quite sure you should be doing that anymore because I think things have moved on. And it's about that, for me, the relationship about the people who hold the power. I think it, it could potentially be more in situ, whereby it's an ongoing process rather than a snapshot judgment of on a given day or two or three days when they come and do your judgment. Because I know, and this is not something to do with Middlesbrough because I wasn't there when the audit process was underway. It was already done. But I talked to people who... We'll talk, and there'll be teachers listening to this who can relate to it from Ofsted inspections where everybody's primed for the inspection. You're briefed what to say when the inspectors come in and how to teach your subjects and how to plan your session. And, and you present your Ofsted inspectors with your, with your session plan and you teach it a certain way. 
And the minute they walk out the door, it looks nothing like. And I think I've spoken to people who've, who've been in academies who've, who've under that stress of of preparing for the audit, of had to brief coaches on what sessions to deliver and how to deliver it. And if you ask this question, this is the type of answer you should be giving. And I, and I think if you can take away that anxiety and stress with people and just keep it an ongoing one yeah. where the, the powers develop relationships with the clubs, I think yeah. that would be a good one. What, what do they say, that wherever the Queen goes, it, it smells it smells of, of pain. It smells of fresh pain. Yeah. The Queen thinks well, well smells of fresh <laughs> pain. Yeah. Okay, uh, last few um, yeah. regular questions before we uh, really let you off the hook. So um, you've been in this uh, in coaching for a long time now. What, what's been the best investment that you've made in yourself? Time. It's funny that because there's a number of people that have said that. Yeah. So why? Time, taking the time to go around and watch, listen. Um, like I said, there's, for me, Pete Trevivian in the early days. I, you, you won't remember it. You're too young to remember um, coaching. So I think a coaching association called AFCAT, Association of Football Coaches and Teachers. Mm-hmm. So that was many, many years ago when I used to go and watch in service events there. I was lucky enough when I was at the County FA to have the likes of Dick Burke come in um, and, and do CPD events for us. Um, investment in time and getting out to just to learn coaching, make mistakes, make loads of mistakes. I've, when we're talking prior to coming on mic, I've sort of written down some of the things I've got up to. And I remember when I was a young coach and qualified in, in the East Riding area where I'm based here in Hull, um, I got to work on the old FA Fun Weeks. You might have even been a participant on one of them because you're that old, <laughs> you're that young. Um, and that was just literally community soccer schools and where we did the five star soccer challenge with kids in football communities and because there wasn't very many coaches qualified or many available I used to get to do all the coastal towns in the East Riding so Hornsey Bridlington and Playton Withensee and places like that and that was working with kids grassroots level kids from five years old to 16 or 14 I think it was at the time and I used to call it snotty nose and shoelace football because you spent more of your time tying shoelaces and wiping kids snotty noses because it was just a place for kids to come during the Easter holidays or the summer holidays and enjoy playing football. And that, again, was in my formative years. And then I'm just looking down the list of things where you make mistakes and you get things wrong. And we advocate for the kids to go out and practice and try things. But then where do coaches get their chances to try things? Any mistakes that stick out in your head? Yeah, well, I'll give you one example, which was really funny. And I was, this was where I was probably toying with empowerment so part of the role, one of the roles I did was 10 years I, used, I managed and coached the East Riding County FA under 18s and we'd played a, a game, I don't know, maybe the week before or something like that and I don't know what the performance was like but I think it might have been disappointing so I was thinking is it, is it me doing too much for the players? Do I just need to be a bit more relaxed and let them have a go? So I decided to talk to the guys we were working with and we decided we would go to the captain thinking about leadership and we were playing Sheffield and Hallam away at Staveley Miners Welfare, which is a lovely ground. I've been there many times since. I've played on that ground. Have you really? Yeah. All blue and white and everything. The yeah. County Youth Cup quarter yeah. finals yeah. as a 17-year-old, yeah. Yeah, there you go, you see. Yeah. So we went there and East Riding County Fair, Sheffield and Hampshire. So I had the 16 players in my squad and I went in the dressing room and this is, I know now looking back, I should have teed all this up. And I said to the, to the captain, right, this is it, lads. Um, decided after last week's performance... I can't really help you because that performance wasn't good enough. So what they decided to do, there's 16 of you in here. Nathan, you're in charge tonight. Off you go. Pick the team. Let me know who it is and tell me who the subs are so I can put the team sheet in. But I'll let you decide how you're going to do it. 5 nil down at half-time. So that was a lesson in if you're going to give ownership and leadership to the players, they'd probably better be prepared for it. So you better have done some prior work. So yeah, that's that's one of my mistakes around favourite mistakes ownership and leadership for players don't, yeah. don't just thrust it upon them and expect them to be able to deal with it because yeah. again I didn't know the players well enough the young lad who was captain was a great lad but he wasn't ready for that so again with your head in the past yeah. from where you first started if, if you were to go back and give yourself some advice what, what would that be? I think it's about re- relax relax about making mistakes um, don't worry that everything has to look perfect. I understand the pressures people are under when they've got parents watching or if you, if you are in a, in a performance environment, say as an academy, and you might have a head of coaching or a head of youth watching you, stuff like that, you feel a pressure to perform to people's expectations of what good coaching looks like. Mm. 
so where do you as coaches get chance to practice and make mistakes and get things wrong so you're going to have to along the way so just relax when they come along the way yeah. I think one, one of the things we talked about recently was when, when you do make a mistake if you can rationalise it and learn from it it's another step in the right direction yeah. but so, so relax when you get things wrong I can remember a time uh, when I was starting to take coaching more seriously and I um, I had an, an interview for a full time coaching role in Manchester and there was me uh, it was a 60 by 40 uh, little 3G uh, I think it was a school and I had a class of about uh, 28 children yeah. from Salford on, on my half of the pitch and there was a girl who was doing a, a another coaching session for again for this recruitment process for this job on the other half of the pitch and I uh, called the children in sat them down got on their level and explained, explained the practice to them and then off you go yeah and all it was was a little uh, agility based tag game that, we, that we'd set up and to my horror about 20 of the kids ran off yeah. to the other half of the Astro where <laughs> this uh, poor girl was delivering her yeah. session picked all her cones up <laughs> and, uh, and ran back to her <laughs> it was like herding cats trying to bring the yeah. ball back in yeah. um, and it was only then I realised that out of a class of 28 there was only about 6 of them that spoke a word of English right yeah so th- yeah. That, that was a that was a uh, quite a painful lesson at the yeah, moment. It was a, yeah. yeah, it was a mistake that I'll never forget. That's no, for sure. No. Um, seen, read, or heard. So, what have you seen, read, or heard uh, in recent memory that's maybe had an impact on your way of thinking or your coaching? Um, I, th- I think uh, heard. Really, I've started to listen to more podcasts, um, and some of the stuff I've been doing around the the coaching philosophy at the club is around skill acquisition and perception, action, coupling. And what what I tend to do myself is when I get to a point where I think I understand something, I start to then question whether I understand it enough and what's the contrary view to that. So I know on another podcast you'll you'll be aware of someone who put a podcast out saying the war on drills, which then created a lot of debate on social media about the value of drills. So I am very much in favour of um, games related practices game based practices appropriate conditions or constraints whatever you want to call them because I I think it's beneficial to working with players in terms of skill acquisition and the perception and action coupling stuff but then I start to go right okay I believe in that but let's look at the value of drills because where do they have a place in the wholeness like if we if you get your players as often as we do then there's a balance somewhere along the line so I'm still so podcasts recently so talent equation yourself Stuff like that, um, exposure to reading around brain brain books. Quiet was a good book I read. Susan Kane. Susan Kane mm-hmm. about introverts, extroverts, but that would we all exhibit different things at different times. Um, Willful blindness by Margaret Heffernan, in terms of why do we choose to confront not to confront the things we know will cause us problems. I've not heard of that. Yeah, yeah. so that was about things like deference in the cockpit to the captain could have saved a number of crashes in the past and stuff like that. Um, that was, that was, I enjoyed reading that. Um, I've, I've done all the usual books around um, bounce and things like that. So, yeah. Um, but I, I would think mainly podcasts these days. And, yeah. and trying, I'm fortunate enough, I suppose, because of the level I've been lucky enough to work at, I get access to some really good people. So before just before leaving the FA... I sat in on a psychology block on the Advanced Youth Award and I had Rick Shuttleworth, Dave Collins and Richard Bailey <laughs> talking. And many years ago, I went to a conference at Leeds Beckett University that was organised by the late Pat Duffy and I was looking to hear Jean Cote speak as well around early specialisation and stuff. So I've been really, really lucky to get exposed to some people who people suggest they UK world leading experts on stuff yeah. and I've been and that's been definitely good for me I think that's one of the benefits of the, that social media has definitely had yeah. which has been the um, the direct access yeah. to these great thinkers and just being able to absorb and, yeah. and, and I, I find um, just trying to pick apart their their thought processes yeah. um, is is sort of stimulating as, yeah. as the content yeah. that they're yeah, putting out there yeah yeah. I think for me like getting to the point where I am now I have some beliefs but I have, my thinking now is just 
try to start challenging my own beliefs. Well, okay. So then that brings me on to the the last question. So what have you, what have you challenged yourself on recently or what have you perhaps changed your mind about? Um, I think drills. Drills is the one that's starting to make me curious because obviously you go into most professional football clubs and you will see, um, let's say, constant practices, generally passing practices, patterns. And I was probably when I was at the FA I was banging the drum across the youth awards about game related practices if you only got the kids for an hour a week play games whole part hall type practices which I still advocate by the way if you've got 16 kids one hour a week whole part hall or play with the start with the game is the best way without a doubt um, but now I've I've gone into clubs and I've seen drills and I'm, I'm starting to say right go on then what is the value of that and that's the bit and now I'm fighting within my head so I haven't, again, I'm sorry if people who are listening, I've not cracked any, half the stuff I'm talking about, I've still not got to a point where I can answer it in my head because I'm still curious about it, yeah. but I'm still trying to rationalise the value of the drills that I see uh, probably on a daily basis in comparison to my views on perception action coupling, which I very much believe in. Um, going back, just going back a little bit in terms of what I've read, seen or heard, that's had an influence. I don't often send a thread, uh, start a Twitter thread, but... I did oh, well. I can vouch you were an egg for about three oh, years. Oh, I was an egg for a, yeah, a lot of years. And, and actually, in my picture, you'll know if uh, you should have a prize on the podcast. If anybody can tell me where I am on my picture, they should get a prize from yourself or Liverpool County FA. But that, that's a good challenge. Sorry, I interrupted that. No, that's all right. No, it's good. But so I started a thread the other week, which I think I might as well mention on here because I think it's really important. Um, I said about across all the recent years, I've been exposed to lots of events, lots of reading, lots of television, stuff like that. But the work done by Pete Sturgis, Paul Alder, John Allpress and Craig Simmons on the creation and the implementation of the Youth Awards stands up against anything. Mm. It really does. When you look at the work that was done, yeah, it all needs tweaks and people then argue about, oh, the our players learn workshop or the 10,000 hours stuff and things like that. But the premise of what the course was and the work they'd done to get it to that point, exceptional. Yeah, yeah, and I think that um, that, that work is... We- tried to evolve it yeah. and, and, and carry it on and dispel some of the or, or look more critically about some of those uh, the you know myths that yeah. you talk about 10,000 hours yeah. and so on and and dispel learning styles as visual auditory yeah. and kinesthetic yeah. and things have moved on but yeah I mean I'd hold and that's it because people, people misunderstand that but when the, the L Players Learn Workshop was never about saying your players are A, B or C it was always about saying look people learn in different ways at different speeds at different times just make sure you don't only try and give them the information in one way. And I think that was, it was misinterpreted. And I'm going to be honest enough to say, I think it was not given out right by some of the tutors. Mm. But that's that's the premise of what he's trying to encourage people to understand yeah. is absolutely right. So yeah. that's, so the work was it was really good. And obviously we, we were lucky enough, and certainly I was, to be exposed to them four guys for a significant amount of my time in the FA. Yeah. And I feel lucky to add that. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. I'm into that. Um, obviously, want to respect your your <laughs> Friday afternoon or Friday <laughs> evening time. And um, is is there anything I haven't asked you that are in your copious notes there that you you had written down that you wanted to get out there that you think? No, mm, yeah, my copious notes just exist around where I've been, lucky enough to go, things I've done. Um, we talked about influences. No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's been a great experience again for me. I love doing stuff like this. And obviously, when I know you was involved in it, I said I'd be happy to do it. Mm. I always go away thinking, don't know if that was any good. So if anybody's listening out there and have enjoyed it, then great. Yeah. Good for good for me and good for them. But it's but I've enjoyed it, just chatting stuff. Great. I know we were talking earlier, weren't we, about the informal stuff, about just chatting. Yeah. And and we I, I had this thing, one of the young coaches at our place, we were just sat stood watching the under thirteens training last night and we were just talking stuff. And you you mentioned earlier Graham Carrick about I, I remember Graham when he first was a skills coach and it, no doubt it's still the same now you can think, think you've finished whatever session you finish with him and you stand in the car park at quarter to nine at night in Newcastle like I often did and you've got it just asks the question what about and he's still there at 10 o'clock with a man wanting to lock up and throw you out the building and stuff like that so that type of informal stuff is valuable yeah. I think we all go on our, our formal learning courses and stuff like that to get that dead formal learning and maybe this is a good message for the coaches so your coach education pathway that you come through you, your formal courses are only the trigger you got to go out and find it through experiences and getting things right getting things wrong so that I think the academics around would say experiential learning mm. 
and that interaction with other people. Yeah. So that, remember that the courses are only the starting point. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, selfishly, you know, this started as a, a project from a, <laughs> a uh, off a formal learning course that I was involved with in, with last year, and it completely spiraled out of control. But it's yeah. honestly been the best thing I think I've ever done personally, yeah. just to have the opportunity to sit down and speak to great people uninterrupted. You know, it doesn't really happen yeah. that too much nowadays in society. I got on the train this morning and <laughs> um, I looked at the platform and there was about 100 people all with their heads in their phones. And I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone yeah. for that, but yeah. having the opportunity to actually interact uh, one-to-one in person with, with, with yeah. so many great people has been, been fantastic. I just hope, hopefully the people out there are... So many great people and then me. <laughs> <laughs> on that note... Um, uh, thanks very much, Andy. I I loved mean, it. Yeah, it's been yeah. been great fun. And uh, if, if people want to find you on Twitter, your your do you know Andy your, Foster zero seven. Andy Foster zero seven. Yeah, we'll put a link on that. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks, Paul. Great. Cheers, Cheers mate. Man. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please help spread the word or leave us a review on iTunes. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. You can reach me on Twitter at Jack Walton One, and don't forget to follow Liverpool FA at. Liverpool underscore CFA. See you next time.